When I bought my quad-core i7-2600K in 2011, I didn't expect Intel to take six more years to finally move past four cores on their regular desktop platform. But whereas AMD has now abandoned the desktop quad-core completely, Intel still hasn't, meaning they've been selling quad-core CPUs for 18 years. And it all started with this, world's first quad-core processor. And this one is particularly unique. Today we'll delve into this chip, see how it performs, run games on it and severely overclock it. So let's get started. To better understand this chip, let's take us back to 2006, where Intel had been extending the life of their aging and rather poor netburst architecture, which ultimately culminated in this chip, the ultimate netburst, the Pentium D Extreme 965. And the bizarre thing was that only weeks before the launch of the 965, Intel showed netburst's successor, Intel Conroe. And with Conroe, Intel took a radical new approach with two cores but no hyperthreading, a way shorter pipeline, lower clock speeds, and it blew both Intel's and AMD's previous efforts out of the water, both in terms of efficiency and performance. But by 2006, two cores just wasn't going to be enough, and AMD was rumored to be working on the successor of the Athlon 64X2, a quad-core chip called the Barcelona. And to make a quad-core chip reality, Intel now took a familiar approach again. Going back to the Pentium D, they took two Pentium 4 dies and put them on the same package, which really was a hack job with one engineer describing it as putting on your pants from college. To fix this and improve yield, they separated the dies in the second generation Pentium D Presner. And Intel now took the same approach again, fitting two Core 2 Duo dies on the same PCB and connecting them via the front side bus. And in November 2006, a few months after the unveiling of the Core 2 Duo, Intel lifted the veils on the Core 2 Quad, codenamed Kensfield. And it all started with this model, the Core 2 Extreme QX6700. And not just any QX6700, but this one in particular. This is an engineering sample, the Intel Confidential QUPES, which is a pre-production version sent out to reviewers before the launch. And for its time, this was a blazingly fast chip with four cores, a 2.66 GHz clock speed, 8 MB of L2 cache, and a 1066 megatransfer frontside bus, all for a sticker price of a cool $1,000. But we're now here 18 years later, and just what is left of this once unprecedented level of performance? Well, let's find out. We're now here in the labs with the QX6700, and I've already installed it into its testbed here, and I've tried to make sure we've gotten as optimal performance as possible. For a start, we're running it on an ASUS X48 chipset motherboard, so that's the last 775 chipset, which also has DDR3 support. So here we're running 16 gigabyte of Corsair Vengeance DDR3. We've got a big Seitenmugen cooler. We've got SSD for Windows 10. We've got an SSD to run our game installations off of. And for our GPUs, I really wanted to make sure we are using this RX 5700 GPU for as minimal driver overhead as possible, but this motherboard wasn't going to work with that. So what I've done here is I've booting it off of a GTX 750 Ti, and then in Windows we can switch over to the RX 5700. It's a bit cumbersome, but it does work. And then as we do have an Extreme Edition CPU, I've also overclocked it from 2.6 to now 3.4 gigahertz using only the front side bus. So as we mentioned previously, the cores are connected via the front side bus, so that should also lift some performance there. And we're running it at 1.45 volts with the DDR3 at 1134 mega transfers. And for our operating system, we're running here with Windows 10, and right off the start, boot time is okay-ish, at around a minute or so. We saw similar performance with the AMD's last single core chip from the previous video. I would have expected a little faster. And in terms of general performance in Windows, it's surprisingly great. We do have, of course, the 16 gigs of RAM, but CPU performance is also pretty good. You can do all kinds of multitasking and not really notice any massive slowdowns. There have been doing some browsing, doing some multitasking, even doing some work in DaVinci Resolve, as we'll get to in a bit. And sure, there are some slowdowns here and there, but even things like Windows Update on the background don't massively impact your performance, which is surprising for a CPU of this age. 
Also, Mewtwo playback, surprisingly good with this GPU. We can play 4K60 with no dropped frames at all. And coming back to DaVinci Resolve, you can actually do some 1080p video editing on it, I'd say. Sure, it's not blazingly fast, but it's snappy enough where the slowdowns aren't that intrusive. And I've done a bit of a test edit here, and an 8 minute 1080p video takes around 15 and a half minutes to render, so around a 2 to 1 ratio. For further benchmarks, we're starting with Cinebench R15, where the overclocked QX6700 scored 330 points, over 2.3 times that of the overclocked Pentium DX3 965, and improving 24% over stock speeds. And when comparing it to an Alder Lake chip, the i5-12600K scored 3.2 times as high in single thread. In 7-zip, the performance gap compared to its Netburst predecessor was also vast, scoring 2.4 times in decompression and 1.7 times in compression, and also gaining around 24% from overclocking. Sandy Bridge was still also around twice as fast here. In terms of operating characteristics, I was also pleasantly surprised. With the overclock in place, it drew only 114 watts in Cinebench, according to the motherboard resulting in a peak temperature of only 65C. Very reasonable stuff. But let's get to something more important, gaming. And here we've got a tall order for the Core 2 Quad running Battlefield 5 64-player multiplayer at 720p with the bare minimum settings. And here it's a chunk faster than the Pentium D I showed in a previous video, running between 15 to 22 FPS or so, depending on the map and how much action's going on. But overall, that's still a too poor of a performance to really enjoy this title. And overall, the Core 2 Quads age is really showing here. Performance was better in GTA 5 at 1080p with the lowest preset, holding steady at around 30 to 35 FPS. However, like most CPUs of this performance, it suffered with GTA 5's issue with loading in textures and assets in time, resulting in a rather unique gaming experience. We didn't see such issues in city skylines, but big cities were definitely taking their toll on the CPU. With small maps it could reach 30 FPS, but with more going on it struggled to reach even 20, which does get tiresome after a while. And then by far the most surprising result was BeamNG Drive, where after an initial load-in, performance was stunningly good at 1080p with medium settings, running between 50 to 80 FPS. And of course, depending on how much was going on, but you could definitely have a playable experience with Beam on the Core 2 Quad. The Core 2 Quad gave rise to a truly unprecedented level of processing power on a consumer CPU, but not everyone was on the same boat regarding the quad-core part. AMD would come to mock Intel for duct-taping two chips together, stating that the Core 2 Quad was not a true quad-core, as it's comprised of two chips. There's one quad core, and then there's a multi chip module, which is two dual cores put together underneath the same package. So let's not confuse the two. One's native quad core, and the other one is a multi chip module, which has four cores. Okay. The duct tape together multi chip module. <clears throat> However, once they did release their own quad core, the Phenom, consisting of a monolithic quad core die, the Core 2 Quad in its archaic design proved to be faster in just about every test. With Anantech saying, if you were looking for a changing of the guard today, it's just not going to happen. Phenom is, clock for clock, slower than Core 2. And interestingly, 11 years later the tables would turn with Intel mocking AMD for gluing together desktop chips in AMD's Epic CPUs. But regardless of who's gluing what, I think the QX6700 is the world's first quad-core, and it's still shockingly usable 18 years on. In fact, the machine I used to write these videos on, a Dell Precision M6400, is powered by a later model Core 2 Quad Extreme QX9300, and that's still a very snappy machine. Just goes to show how long you can now keep using older technology, and that perhaps the rate of progress has just declined sharply, just depending on your, how you look at it. In any case, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, a like it would be very much appreciated. And why not subscribe to the Fully Buffer channel? In any case, that was all for now, and bye bye.